Welcome back to another episode of Nakoa's Lunchtime Lives, a series of live interviews that go out across our social media platforms where I interview people that have advocated for Nakoa and COAs alike. And in this interview, I speak to the absolute Nakoa legend that is Jonathan Ashworth. Jonathan has been amazing for Nakoa over the years, raising awareness and helping to create policy change that has literally changed the way in which we view and interact with COAs in this country and to a degree globally as well. And we talk about Jonathan's experience and it really is incredible to see uh, a politician speak about his experiences in the way that Jonathan manages to do in, in this interview with us. We talk about some of that policy change, some of the things that we've done with the APPG, uh, and we look at COA Week 2021 and the success that that was. This was a great way to wrap up the COA Week of 2021. And I really do hope that you enjoy this interview. For me, it was really, really powerful. If this is the first time that you've ever been here, please make sure you have subscribed and turned on the notifications so you know each and every time that we post a video. And sit back and take in the incredible interview with Jonathan Ashworth. Ah, there you go. <laughs> I can't believe how quickly you switched from your laptop to your phone. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, though. Uh, I'm going to have to plug this phone in because it might die. Hang on. Keep talking. You know, you know what you're doing. I'll keep talking. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep talking. Hussein has just said that last night is fantastic. I do want to say, you know, as we come to the back end of, of COA week, just a massive thank you to everybody that's taken part and the things that everybody's done. I particularly want to mention the people on the helpline, by the way. Uh, it's easy to forget. Uh, how important the helpline is, particularly during COA week when we're all doing awareness raising. Uh, people like Abby and Evie who work tirelessly to make sure that these children that we're raising awareness for have somebody uh, to speak to when, you know, when they pick up the phone. Uh, the problem with it being on charge, John, is that it, you can't stand it up now, can you? No, uh, it'll be fine. I'll hold it for a bit. And then it'll be fine. And then I can take it off charge for a bit. That'd be fine. Yeah, there you go. Uh, every live that we do, uh, as COAs, we're always tested a little bit in the tech some way to just, just to prove that we've got that resilience that we always talk about. How are you doing anyway? Uh, I'm good. And then, uh, I mean, this is obviously the first time I've uh, been on an Instagram live, as you can tell, because I <laughs> don't have a clue what I'm doing with the technology. Um, but uh, I'm doing good. It, it wasn't last night phenomenal. I mean, it was an amazing uh, discussion. Uh, everybody involved, I think, just spoke so with such power and such emotion, and it was so raw. Uh, and uh, yeah, coming out of last night's discussion on on the Zoom call, I mean, the, the thing is, usually we do these things in the House of Commons, don't we? And it's us on a platform speaking to people. But I think because it was a Zoom, it was such more of a, uh, a conversation rather than us getting up and making sort of speeches, if you like. And I just found that really powerful. Yeah, yeah. I think, I was just sort of saying just before you came on as well, that there's a lot of benefit to these online things that you actually might not have realised were there. I do a lot of the stuff that I do even in my professional life online, and I thought you'd never be able to. But like you've just said, there's huge benefits. And last night was... Um, incredible i sort of struggled to get to sleep a little bit uh when we came off of it because i was sort of so so lively and it was so nice to have everyone together yeah and then i mean after the zoom and yeah you know i spoke to liam directly spoke to camilla spoke to callum directly there was everyone was really kind of uh buzzing about it but it's so but also felt kind of so kind of uh exhausted because you're talking about such personal things in such a and it is difficult for, for us. I mean, you know, I'm a politician. It's my job to uh, speak and stand on platforms and talk about issues. Um, and I've I've told my story now, um, you know, with platforms with, with you guys and on other platforms. And uh, even when I tell my story, I mean, I didn't really tell my story last night. I just sort of hinted at little bits of it. Um, it still feels emotional, heartrending to get that out there and when you come away from that you do feel so sort of emotionally exhausted but at the same time you feel you feel a sense that in that if you by telling your story you're helping others um it's mm. a really it's a really interesting phenomenon yeah 
yeah. And do, 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 have you sensed that in the ways that you've told it? Like, have you had to take a back seat after doing it? Have you had to? Because I know from me, from sharing, I talked a little bit about it last night actually. That how I've had to. I did. I did some sharing, then I had to actually go back into myself for a while and take take a bit of time off because uh, because of the impact they had on me, sort of physically and emotionally, really. Yeah. So you know, I've told my story in the House of Commons, didn't I? Uh, well, it must have been. It was in 2017, so a few years ago now. And I t and I told the the really. I think the the thing that got a lot of people wasn't just the the circumstances in which I grew up in. It, it was it actually how this continued to impact the relationship with my dad when I, as an adult, to the extent that my dad, because of his drinking, felt he couldn't come to my wedding. He felt that his drinking would embarrass me at my own wedding, and therefore he just didn't show up. And I was actually furious with him at the time. I, 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 and, you know, a lot, I think a lot of children of alcoholics have these complex emotions, and they do go, go through periods of being really furious with their parents, even though they know that their parent has a, has a problem and deserves help, support, and sympathy. You can't help go through those periods of anger. And I was really angry with him when he couldn't come to my wedding. Um, and what is most heartbreaking about it is that it was only uh, it, the wedding was in the July and the September he was dead. Wow. Uh, um, and, you know, people sometimes, you know, in telling these stories, we, we obviously focus on the impact of children as when they are children. But this issue continues to impact you as you grow up mm. and it continues to impact. And, and I, and I, and I reflect on it. And I think about it. I ask myself questions. Um, uh, I think about, I, I have guilt in telling the stories because it's like, am I betraying him? Am I speaking ill of the dead, if you like? Um, am, I, uh, am I being unfair? Because a lot of this is based on my memories. I, it, 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 is my memory caricaturing it? Um, lo a whole load of complex emotions swirl around your head, and then, but then on the other hand, I feel that I have a, a I am very lucky to have this platform. Not, not only am I a politician, I'm a, I'm a shadow health spokesperson. I get on the um, TV every week, uh, like you do, Josh. Um, but <laughs> I, I've got a, um, you know, I want to use this platform to do good, you know, and it, and it'd be easy for me in this job to say. You know, the Conservative government have done this, they've done that, this, that, aren't they terrible? And you know, that's obviously a big part of my job. But I also wanted to use this platform to speak up for children who there are not many people who are speaking up for them. This movement is growing. It's getting so strong. It's brilliant now that more every year, more and more people come along to the annual lecture. Uh, and So it is a growing movement. But, you know, we're not as big a movement as some of the other um, mental health related movements, if I can put it put it like that and it and i still think about it i still think about him every day i loved him uh, you know i regret desperately that um he's not with us um you know i do mean it i said last night there is something funny or spooky or whatever about the fact that both me and callum are on the same platform because i'm convinced my dad would have met callum's dad in the 70s in manchester they would have, mm. you know, he, 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 Callum's dad would have gone in to my dad's workplace, and I'd love to be able to talk to my dad to da and say, ask him about it, and say, and, and say, did you meet Callum's dad in the seventies? He must have done. I can't believe he didn't. And um, uh, so it's so complex. This is, and then I suppose the final bit of this is like, you know, you all sort of, uh, you know, say I'm kind of mad or whatever for running marathons i think in some ways the marathon running is for me how i deal with this and process a lot of it those long mm. distance runs is where i think through a lot of these things and i feel better when i finish a long distance run um you know and uh and i don't know when i start off those london marathons it's weird there's something really determined in my head my dad's mm. in my head. I put on my... I, I have to run to music, so I, I download all the music that he would have liked, like The Who and The 
uh, and the Kinks and all the sort of great sort of Led Zeppelin, all the sort of bands that would, would have been big in the sort of 70s. So all the music that I knew he was into, I download it all and it keeps me going. Now, this is all sounding a bit, maybe this is sounding a bit spiritual. It's not, you, it's you not sound, it sounds in, it, I, like it really resonates with me and it's like, it sounds really special as well. And like, when you talk, whenever you talk about the marathon, by the way, the running the marathon, it's like a really um, powerful thing to me because I had this thing when I was a kid, when my dad died, I was nine, right, when my dad died. And I always used to look at people running marathons, you know, with t-shirts on, with like, uh, you know, Cancer Trust or whatever it might be, people running to raise money for charities because they had lost their parents, right? And I always used to think, even if I wanted to, I, like I couldn't do that. What, what would I put on my t-shirt? Like alcoholic dads or something like that and i remember just thinking i'll never be able to do it it just would never happen uh it'll probably still never happen me running a marathon but the fact that you ran it and you and, and you know when i used to think what did my what would my t-shirt say and here you are in the position that you are running it with nakoa on it i just think it's like really powerful well i mean you, you can run it with me if you want <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> i wouldn't uh, keep up with you uh, I'm not. I'm not particularly fast. I mean, I'm. You know, I'm not. I'm a. I'm a. You know, I'm a short bloke. Um, so I'm not <laughs> especially fast runner. Um, so you probably do a better time than me. Um, I mean, I'm not built like a runner. I'm not a natural <laughs> runner. I just sort of. But I just have the determination to do it. Uh, but it's as I say, it's weird because I set off and my dad's in my head. I'm listening to the music that he would have liked. And the thing is, right, my relationship, it's a really complicated set of this. This is not, like you were saying last night, quite rightly, people think of people with drink problems as, you know, the alky sat on the park bench drinking out of a paper bag. Uh, and, and that's not what, what my dad was. And there were lots of parents who were not like that. Yeah, there undoubtedly are people who've got serious, serious uh, addiction problems and as a result of that, those addiction problems have lost their home and are sleeping rough but this is a broader and deeper problem than that and you see uh, I was lucky with my dad I've always said this he was never violent there was none of those types of issues um, you know never never violent towards children never um, sexually violent towards women none of that none of that side of it was with my dad but and in actual fact he was a he was a sort of party guy people liked his company people you know he would you know get the get the drink out put the records on you know great fun times and and who doesn't want a party but when everybody else leaves the party it's me picking up the pieces with a drunk father and it's every week it's every week it's every week it's did you get did you get to did you get to enjoy the fun guy that he was i mean yeah at times yeah mm. but it's the kind of relentlessness of it mm. the non-stop um, and it's you know and it's not just he's not just drinking for a party he's having a, he's then having a party on his own Mm. You know, drinking and drinking, sticking the music on, blasting out. Uh, and you get to the point where you're the person sorting things out. You're, you know, you're the, you're the person, you know, going to the shop to get the food. You're the person dealing with stuff. Um, you know, you're the per yeah. And you're a kid, but you're a kid. <laughs> you're, yeah. not an adult. you're not an adult. And obviously, the, and then you go through that period, particularly when you're a teenager, because you're, you know, teenagers are, are, are are embarrassed and feel awkward around their parents at, at the best of times. But then, you know, when you're a teenager, you just feel really sort of anxious all the time. Oh, he's drunk again. He's drinking again. You know, what's going on? Uh, you, you get all that again. Um, I, and it's just like, there I am, me and him. The fridge is empty apart from bottles of these cheap white wine. Or, you know, he's come to meet me um, uh, from school and he's fallen over because he's so drunk at the sort of outside the school. Uh, all that, all that type, type of stuff. Uh, and it's just, it, it's just relentless. It never stops. And it gets worse as he gets older. And it, and as I say, 
the worst thing was that he, for me, was when I was an adult, I just went back for Christmas one year and he just literally said, I am going to Thailand. And I said, what? And he went, I've had enough. I'm going to live in Thailand. And I just thought it was drink talking. I just thought, oh, he, you know, he's been on the piss again. It's just nonsense. Um, and no, he did. He literally, in the February, he packed his bags and he went to Thailand like that. He must have been, he must have been 59. Just went. And by all accounts, he just sat in Thailand drinking bottles of Thai whiskey every day. And a year, uh, 18 months later or so, while well, right, he was 60, he was dead. And that was wow. that. Did you, did, you, did you ever have any moments with him where we talked to Colleen yesterday, who's from the States, and he does a lot of sort of advocating, and she had a moment with her mum before she lost her mum, where her mum sort of looked her in the eye and said, I'm, I'm sorry. Did you ever, like, have a conversation where you felt like, you, you, you sort of reached him on that level. I never got that opportunity with my dad, for example. I tried to talk to him, but he didn't believe he had a problem. Mm. And I think because in his head, an alcoholic is the alky, you know, sat on the park bench, um, you know, drinking out of a paper bag. Because he went, to, he, he would say, well, I can go, I go to work. And it's not a problem. I can, you know, I can and he did. He, he did go to work. He was a croupier in, a, in Manchester casinos. Um, it, in the eight, in the late seventies and early eighties, when the pl Playboy Casino was up and running in Manchester, which is where I think is the link with Callum's dad, he would be drinking a bottle of Canadian club whiskey a day, mm. and my mum had to. My mum had to sort of bundle him out of the casino before anyone could see him. I had to just sort of get him out of the place because he was over. so. And then he ended up in hospital. So he had a scare in the eighties. So then he said, "Well, what I'm going to do is I'm not on the days I'm uh, in the casino, I'm not going to drink." And he, and he kept to that. But the problem was, as soon as he was off work for a weekend or a week off, he was just drunk. Come the whole time so he mm. would tell himself well because i can discipline myself for the days i go to work i don't have a problem but then it, all that happens is you just sort of fair enough you go to work and you don't but when but when it comes around to the weekend which is when you have me as your child because my mum's left you because of the drinking so i come to stay at yours from fridays to sundays you just you know you're just drunk Mm. completely drunk and I tried to talk to him and he'd say and he'd always insist he's not got a problem or or because you know his drinking was always a sort of joke thing for a lot of his friends I, I remember like going they did a the, 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 the casino put on they did a football match one casino's staff against another Manchester casino staff and my dad was in goal which was a bizarre thing to put my dad in goal because he's, he's the, you know he's the same sort of height as me we're like five foot seven <laughs> We are not built to be goalkeepers, us Ashwefs. We are short people. So God knows why he was in goal. But he was in goal. And I remember the other, the, like, the, the sort of people from the other casinos who were watching, sort of laughing. They, not in a spiteful way, but they were saying, oh, John Ash is in goal. Just throw, you know, four cans of Stella that, that way and he'll die for that rather than the ball. Mm. Now, they were making that joke. As, they weren't making that in a spiteful way. They were making that joke in an affectionate way. But for me, as an eight-year-old at the football game, I found that really upsetting because it was like, that's my dad and this isn't funny. That So even then I knew this wasn't a nice thing. But mm. I could see amongst his groups of friends and things, it was a sort of, you know, just a sort of fun thing. And, 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 and that is part of society's attitudes to drink, isn't it? You know, let's all get out. Let's all go out and get absolutely hammered. Oh, you know, I, I was absolutely smashed last night. Wasn't it funny? All that kind of stuff is part of society, isn't it? You know, we think it is funny and uh, uh, to go out and get absolutely off our heads. And, mm. you know, and that's fine. You know, I don't, you know, students will do that and all that. I mean, you know, I'm not a killjoy, but there's often partners, loved ones, sons and daughters who are at the end of it and many of them not in a, not lucky like I was, you know, mm. because a lot of people in these circumstances 
turn to violence or or do other horrible things when drunk. Mm. Uh, luckily, I didn't have any of that. I just had I just had I just had drunkenness and trying to manage somebody who was drunk on yeah. my own as a child. Yeah, Does that somebody's, makes sense. It, it makes total sense. And somebody's just come in here. Claire said, "I think it's society's stereotypes of alcoholics makes it so much harder for people to admit they have a kind of addiction problem. It's so stigmatized." Uh, label for identity as opposed to an illness and I think there is a lot in that right in what we make uh, what we call problems with alcohol you know what we call alcoholism it, it kind of allows people to just think as long as I go to work if I don't drink when I'm in the casino or whatever then you haven't got a problem right so it becomes even harder for, or, or easier for people to hide it and uh, I think you've captured that as well in what you've said um, do you did you always have a desire? Did you always know that this was a um, a topic? This was an issue that you would try and tackle in the work that you do. Well, that's really interesting. So, no, I didn't. And when I uh, when I spoke, <sighs> I hadn't quite planned it. I knew Liam had spoken out and Caroline Flynn, and I'd said to them privately, "Oh." Well done. I'm in a similar setup. I really admire you. But I didn't really think I was going to do much on it. Because I felt it was quite a private thing. And this, and a lot of my friends are quite surprised I did it. Because I'm usually quite sort of private about, you know, personal life and all that kind of type of stuff. I'm not one for, you know, banging on about it in public. Um, so a lot of people were quite surprised when I did it. And then... I did an interview uh, on health policy with a newspaper and I just sort of blurted it out by accident. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh, I'm, you know, I've set this off now. And then there was the debate in Parliament, which was about alcohol abuse. And I was actually speaking in that debate in my formal shadow health capacity role. And, and I was just planning to do a more general speech about, you know, the cuts to addiction services, you know, the need for an alcohol strategy, um, uh, things like that, all the, you know, all the big policy stuff. I ended up just thinking, you know, I'm just going to throw this speech away. and I'm just going to tell my story. Uh, so I, and I just did. I just got up and mm. I just told it. And obviously it, it was, the clip was recorded and it went around social media and it sort of took off and went viral, as they say. And the minister responding, Nicola Blackwood, Conservative minister, really, really nice woman. Um, she actually lost her seat. Um, so I think she's in the House of Lords now, but she was in tears listening to the speech. It just sort of, you know, it's one of those ones which is, really did get shared around Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff and uh, had loads of views. And I just told the story. And I'm glad I did because then, like, Jeremy Hunt got in touch, who was the health secretary at the time, and said, well, sir, I'm really moved by this. Is there anything we can do? to help and that's when i said well liam and others have been working on a plan to support children and alcoholics will you look at it and that's what, and then in turn came the funding of some pilots and i think nicoa got some funding as well and we need to push them to extend that funding i didn't quite realize until camilla said it that the funding could run out for some groups in march so we've really got to push them on that so it, it kind of wasn't as planned in quite the way that i thought I was going to do it but I sort of I just sort of spoke from the heart and I'm glad I did and and the reason I'm glad I did is because I was at a train station I think it was Birmingham train station somebody came up to me and said are you like John Ashworth and I was like oh god where's this going you know when someone comes up to you and sort of approaches you like that and says are you that John you know well, I'm oh, yeah what's this going to be yeah what's this gonna be? what have I done now because we you know as politicians and he said I just want to thank you I was like what he said my son, my teenage son, saw your video on Facebook. And because of that video, I was able to have a conversation or it opened up an opportunity for a conversation with my son about my own drinking. And I just want to thank you for allowing that to happen. So whoever that man was, that was just a, it's just a golden moment. Worth it just for that. Yeah, and it was it must have been a massive moment, like it's certainly from the outside looking in, it seemed like a massive moment, right? For it to be kind of so cross party that the lady Nikki was it what's her name? Nikki 
Nicola Nicola Blackwood, yeah. Nicola Blackwood, yeah, was 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 crying in the way that she was, and it was like a real moment of vulnerability, like from 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 both of you, from both sides, to be able to do it. Does that even happen much in Parliament, by the way? No, I mean politics is a real rough game, dirt, dirty game. Sadly, I mean, it shouldn't be. I mean, there are cross-party initiatives going on all the time, yeah, uh, which don't get the don't get highlighted in the way that they should. Um, um, but what is unusual is for that sort of cross-party working from a front bench people, because my job as the shadow health secretary is to you know to be knocking bells out of the actual health secretary, if you like. I mean. People watching might not like that, but that's kind of how politics works, you know. Yeah, yeah. So it's quite unusual for that level of cross-party working at um, at this level, you know, at shadow cabinet and cabinet level. And indeed, when Jeremy Hunt announced the new funding in response to our campaign, we actually put out a joint press release. That is unheard of. Yeah. For a cabinet minister to do a press release with the opposite number. Um, and I'm pretty proud of that because although I, you know, I'm a politician. I obviously, you know, I'm Labour because I obviously believe that Labour values are better for the country and I don't want a Conservative government. So, look, you know, I can't, I'm not going to make any apology about that. But I was pleased in that we were able to do this joint working and, and now I think we've got to now make sure we ex- ex- extend it. Um, but it is, maybe there should be more of that in politics, but sadly politics can get a bit can get a bit nasty and rough and, and dirty at times. So it's nice yeah. to write above that. But that was a lot of that was born out of that vulnerability piece, right? I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to hang around on it too much, but the fact that you allowed yourself to be vulnerable in that way, right, it, it, in the situation that you did, it, it, it is what created that kind of change and those things that don't normally happen. And Camilla, Camilla is in the house and has just said that they're already working on a story to run next week, piling on the pressure to the government to to renew the funding, which kind of is a nice segue actually into some other stuff that I want to talk about. Obviously, NACOA has seen, um, you know, calls and contacts to the helpline. They're up 40% over the year. They originally, they doubled, right? Um, And we've got like literally people like Abby and Evie that are working on the helplines, right? That are answering these calls. I think it's really important to, to, to highlight, you know, that there are human beings that are, are ringing the helpline and, and, and people that are answering the phones, right? What do you think needs to be done for us to, 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 to keep this going, to make well, it a priority? Well, I mean, just thank you to everyone on the lines. And I just want to say, Derek, to those on the, on the lines as well, you'll be carrying a lot of burden mm. and you need to make sure you look after yourself as well. Yeah. You, know, you need to look after your well-being and your own mental health because you'll be dealing with people children in very desperate circumstances and you will want to do all you can to help so make sure you spend take some time to look after your own mental health there is one of the lessons of all of this and whether it's about addiction or anxiety or just generally feeling down you know looking after your mental health and your own well-being is so important there's nothing soft or you know, uh, wimpy or all these things about spending some time to look after your own mental health. I think that's one of the big lessons I've learned throughout this whole last few years uh, 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 and, the, and, the, and the crisis. So thank you to those on the phones, but just make sure you you are putting yourself first sometimes. Um, I think we know that lockdown has made things so much worse. And as I was saying last night, look, I've, I've supported lockdown. And I, I know how awful this virus is you know, uh, it's horrific and you've got to do all you can to break chains of transmission. And the cruelty of this virus is that it essentially exploits social interaction because it's airborne, it's respiratory. You know, you get it from talking to each other by breathing out the droplets or coughing out the droplets. That's why it's so cruel. So the, the, the easiest way to protect yourself until vaccines and things like that have been fully implemented is to isolate yourself. But that in itself brings with it all kinds of mental health problems. It was the great novelist John Steinbeck who wrote, a sad soul can kill you quicker than any germ. And while that might not be quite biologically correct, we can see the point he's making. Mm. Isolation uh, means that if if you've got an addiction problem, a drink problem, 
it will worsen. And we've seen data coming out. There's more data out today from a report today showing drinking in the household up, uh, particularly amongst women. They're seeing more drinking uh, in the household amongst women. Uh, um, and sadly, whether we like it or not, a lot of caring responsibilities fall on women. Um, statistically, we, we can have a debate whether, that, whether that's correct or not. But I think statistically, we know what we mean there. Uh, actually, and the biggest increase in deaths, excess deaths after COVID, is liver disease and cirrhosis in this pandemic. Wow. That's excess deaths up 11%. Now, it's not, as I said last night, it's not as simple as to say drinking is up so more people are dying from liver disease because liver disease is also about uh, obesity. It'll also be about the NHS focusing on COVID rather than, uh, or, or had to cancel some treatments or postpone some treatments. So, so there'll be a complex set of reasons into that. But the fact that liver, deaths from liver disease and cirrhosis are up 11% should be a cause for concern for all. I mean, a proportion of that is because of drink, drink abuse. Mm. No question. You know, we've seen uh, prescriptions for antidepressants went up following the lockdown last year. We know people are really, really struggling. Uh, and we know that means that children will be really, really struggling. And they'll be struggling with parents who are, who are abusing drink. And sadly, they'll be in uh, a desperate situation because we know, sadly, some of those parents, that drink abuse will, will turn to domestic violence and sadly, in some cases, sexual abuse as well. So this is such a serious, serious thing. And I, and I hope we can persuade the government to extend the funding initiatives, the projects, even to go further, because mm -hmm. I fear that as we come out of this lockdown, there's going to be a lot, there's going to be a lot of problems, mental health and addiction problems we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. The, yeah. Because, you know, there needs to be a massive recovery period now. It's like, it's no good saving loads of lives if we're not going to sort of look after them once they've been saved. Right. And I think like when you look at some of the things that Nakura has already had in place and, and, and has had in place for years, right. The, 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 uh, uh, help for professionals, the, the information packs that we can send out to professionals, to teachers, right. Uh, we've got a new one for CAMS professionals as well, and we're going to get a specific one for COVID, right? For people that may have been struggling with COVID. It's things like that, though they seem they may seem simple, right? That give us the opportunity to get in and educate these the people that are with these children a lot, right? Do you, do you think that there's more that could be done in schools? Do you think that that should be something that we should be looking at, or is it not that simple? And I, I think we do need to look at schools. I think I think there's two things that we need to think about. Uh, is that how we get awareness of this issue in schools and what support mechanisms can be put in place. We're supposed to be putting in place now, or the government is supposed to be putting in place more mental health and wellbeing support into schools. As part of that um, new service that is, in theory, being rolled out, I think, I think uh, looking at drink abuse and addiction problems should be part of it. So that should be part of that. Uh, requirements of that new mental health service that will hopefully be rolled out in schools. I mean, I think I, I obviously want schools the, or the government to go uh, further and faster with their service. Um, um, you know, I want them to get on with it as soon as possible. But I think definitely having an awareness around alcohol abuse should be a key part of that. I talk to head teachers here in my Leicester constituency where I live now. Who tell me they're really worried and they can see it. They can see the. They can, they can see. Um, or when they where they can see alcohol abuse, they they they're not quite sure how to deal with it, but they're worried that more of it goes on behind closed doors. And what are the signs they should be looking out for? That's the first mm. thing. The second thing is, right, you know, if, if we've got this huge increase in people dying from liver disease and cirrhosis, eleven percent increase, right, the biggest increase outside of COVID deaths in this last year, are those people affected are they being asked about whether there's children whether the, where, where the family situation is i think that is something we need to look at as well um there are some ho hospital trusts who do this well i mean last year um i think it was last year or certainly in the last you know recent times i went to the hospital in um the bournemouth and pool hospital who have a really good service on alcohol they take it really seriously 
um, uh, and they have a whole um, infrastructure around people who are admitted for alcohol problem problems, and people being admitted to hospital for alcohol problems has increased uh, out before the COVID period took off. So it's whether we can whether we can have some requirements around that as well, whether there is a sort of whether that has to look into or find out about children impacted as well. I think that's something we should look at. Yeah, and that's you know that that's like some of the real like uh, deep kind of work that needs to be done on a bit more of a like surface level, right? How do we how do we get the message across to people in general, right? I sit here as somebody who's experienced a lot of the things that you've experienced. When you talk, I, you know, it gives me a lump in my throat. I sort of I know that you're speaking to a part of me that really resonates with the things that you're saying. There's a, clearly a lot of people in here sort of watching this in the same the same way as well, right? But how do we get the message to like the wider public without sounding like we're, we're bashing alcohol, which you don't in any way, by the way, in what you're saying. But how do we get that? Because a lot of people get protective over alcohol, don't they, in our society? So, so we've got to be careful that we get that balance right. Yeah, I, I, I think, I mean, you're, you're spot on there. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not, it's funny. I got an, in, an email yesterday from the um, alcohol industry people because they'd obviously seen I've been talking about this highlighting all the things that they've done in the pandemic, like turning over distilleries to make uh, hand sanitizers and things like that. And, you know, you know, well done to them. I'm not, I'm, pr I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm not, a, I'm not one for banning alcohol. Um, you know, uh, um, you know, the, the, um, the, actually the Labour Party was actually formed, you know, 120 years ago. One of its big causes was temperate the temperance movement banning alcohol but you know that that's one of the labor policies that has got that has got lost over the years uh, you know and, and i you know i always say this as well i do i i i'm not teetotal i do drink um but i'm always very anxious about where i drink i don't i, I, I mean i'm sat in my house now i very rarely drink in the house um so, you know, we're in a lockdown. I, I don't think I've drank, I've not actually drank since Christmas because mm. I drank, I drink socially. But, uh, so I'm not, an, I'm, I'm not a Puritan. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to ban things. Um, but I want there to be proper support for people when they do have a problem. I want them, to, I want there to be services for people when they have a problem. I want us to understand the impact that it's having on children. I want us to be honest in this country about the impact of um, uh, uh, very, very high strength, cheap alcohol uh, and the availability of it. Um, you, know, you know, I just want us to have a mature debate in this country about alcohol and how we handle it. Um, because, you know, uh, you know, nobody, I don't want to ban alcohol. Uh, I, I, people don't want to drink, that's their personal choice, but I'm not going to moralize against people who do want to have a drink at a social event, at a, at a party, at a wedding, at a family occasion, or whatever. But we've got to be honest, the, the re, the, 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 uh, apart from infectious diseases like COVID, the biggest killers is, are smoking, uh, alcohol, uh, lack of physical exercise, and the fact that we eat too much high-fat, high-sugar food. You know, that is what is making people ill fundamentally. That's mm. why we've got more and more people with different conditions, whether it's uh, diabetes or heart disease or high blood pressure or, you know, whatever it is, you know, these are the things that make people ill. So we need to think about how we deal with those things as a society and make sure there's particular support available so people don't abuse alcohol and develop problems. So people can give up smoking. So people can make, healthier choices about what they eat and, and there are and people can access green space to exercise more mm. these are questions for society and and what i'm what i'm interested in and want uh, what i want to involve myself in as somebody who wants to be a health secretary yeah no listen uh, 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 and i think you the, the reason i kind of brought the question up is because i know how well certainly for me you speak very balanced about it right you you, you don't and 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 the co has always been very good at that as well we're never making judgments on anyone we're simply here to raise the, the the issue and the needs that these children or adult children face as a result of of somebody's drinking i'm conscious of time jonathan and i know uh i know you've got a busy day today uh one question that i do like to ask everyone that comes on here well it's I, i've tended to ask everyone uh it's a bit of a deep one 
but I'm going to ask you it. Uh, if you could go back now and speak to 12-year-old Jonathan in the life that he was living then, what would you say to him? Gosh, what a great question. I think... I think there is no question. I, 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 you know, my dad was a groupier. My mum was a bunny girl. I grew up in North Manchester, went to a comprehensive school. But I've clearly done all right. I've ended up being a member of parliament. Before I was a member of parliament, I worked in Downing Street for a Labour prime minister and then became a member of parliament and now a member of the shadow cabinet. Clearly, my the circumstances of my upbringing haven't impacted my career progression. I think, looking back, one of the how one of the how I dealt with some of these these problems was burying myself in work, mm. burying myself in academic work, burying myself in trying to do well professionally. Now. Some people might say, "Good for you," that you know, you've, that's great. I think if I was honest, looking back, I probably should have, uh, and that, that was obviously my coping mechanism. Mm. My coping mechanism was to just really focus on, on um, trying to do as best as I could. Maybe looking back, I should have spent more time trying to help him. Maybe talk to him, um, particularly as I got older. Eight, as an 18 year old as a 19 year old be less frustrated with him um, maybe things could have been different I don't know mm. feels like a big it feels like a big burden to carry for me I feel like uh, it's definitely something that if I could go back I'd feel the same as well when I was a kid could I have showed my dad uh, that I loved him enough but I don't know they're complex questions right and they're complex thoughts that there's no real Obvious answer to, but I really, I'm really grateful that you could answer, that you always answer the questions in the way that you do, right? In in a real way where you're willing to go to that vulnerability and reflect in that way. I know you've got to go, so I don't want to keep you any longer. I do want to say, um, genuinely, from a personal level, but I I do speak on behalf of everyone here. That I, I don't want to make you feel awkward, but genuinely, what you are willing to do and what you're willing to risk, I will use that word for Nakoa. To, to kind of get the message out there and to 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 get the help and support that people need and deserve in this space it's beyond comprehension how grateful we all are and I mean that so and you know the fact that in and amongst everything you're still willing to take time out to do things like this from last night uh, it means a hell of a lot to us and it and it means that ultimately you know people's lives will be a lot different as a result so I speak on behalf of everyone. I know I do when I say that. So I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate your time today. And um, I look forward to watching you run the London Marathon in October. Uh, no, I said watch you. Not, not. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get you running it. <laughs> They've already been egging me on in there. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll see. We'll see. Is there anything you want to add, Jonathan, before I let you go? No, I mean, just thank you to Nakoa for what you're doing. I mean, it is an extraordinary charity. Uh, it is brilliant. And uh, we just want to help Nago go, to go from strength to strength. I mean, there are other charity groups doing similar work, and I always feel a bit bad that I've, I'm always so associated with Nakoa. So a shout out to some of the other groups out there. I know the Children's Society uh, do stuff, AdFam. So, you know, you know. Um, but obviously, nakoa has got a special place in my heart because you've given me so much support. Um and, you know, I'll be really proud to, to, to attempt another London Marathon for you, you guys. So uh, um, keep going with all that you're doing. Keep, and keep going with what you're doing, Josh. It is extraordinary the way you speak so personally as well about your story. And it will make an impact. There'll be people who don't necessarily want to come forward, who don't necessarily want to put, put comments on the Instagram or the Twitter because they don't want to reveal themselves. But there'll be people out there who will find what you're doing, what Nicole is doing, a huge, huge comfort and help. So, you know, you're doing good work. So you should be proud of yourselves. So thank you. Thanks, John. Take care and we'll see you very soon, I'm sure. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.